Well, welcome everybody to the opening of the Connected Learning, Learning Summit 2021. Um, I'm, I'm glad they're all here joining us, either in real time or, or watching this later on. Um, uh, this is an event we've long been looking forward to. Um, before I before I get started um, on my on my brief introductory uh, sort of overview, um, I did want to recognize that this is a virtual conference, and, and people are spread around the world under different current and historical circumstances. But today, I'm speaking to you from Pelham, Massachusetts, um, which is part of the unceded land of the Nunatuck people. I um, mean, I'd like to offer my respect to the original inhabitants of this land and other indigenous peoples of this region, past, present, and future. I understand that um, as we've moved worldwide, this kind of acknowledgement at the beginning may be more or less familiar to you, um, as it was relatively um, new to me uh, in the United States. Um, but I encourage you to recognize the history of the land and um, the people you are on um, where appropriate throughout this conference. Um, with that said, um, I'd like to uh, say that, that the Connected Learning Summit was envisioned as a place to bring together educators, researchers, designers, and innovators of all sorts in the field we broadly define as connected learning. We hope to bring together people around playing, making, learning, and socializing. And we also hope to do that in both Cambridge and Irvine. Of course, that latter part has been disrupted over the last couple of years, um, but the community that comes together today and over the next month um, shows that the original vision is still alive and well. Uh, we have uh, over 220 sessions um, throughout the next month um, of the Connected Learning Summit. Um, as of yesterday late, um, there were 759 participants registered, which is really an astonishing number. And I, I welcome all of you, and I'm so glad that so many people are participating. Um, and they come from um, over 30 countries and, uh, and 40 states um, within the United States. Uh, we have a large variety of session times um, uh, from uh, are, are, that are, are rotating around the world, and I'll mention that briefly uh, in a bit, um, but we do have sessions that come at different times of the day, um, so we try to be welcoming both to people um, on the east and west of the United States as well as um, in other parts of the world, and we have special times for um, uh, in the Asia-Pacific region as well. And then in terms of formats, um, I'm not going to go through all of them here, um, but we have everything from Ignites um, to my favorite, the Hall of Failure, um, which is uh, it, which we'll see throughout the, the sessions. Um, we also have an extended welcome session, which is coming up. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and, and we've chosen our platform, Clouder, um, which we hope uh, uh, will, will may take a few minutes to get used to as you get as you have been familiar with other platforms um, throughout over the last year and a half. And we do think that this platform offers a lot of nice facilities for socializing and connecting um, that we think will be useful throughout the throughout the next month. Um, so we hope that you uh, engage in the platform and I see already a lot of you are engaging the chat, which is which is really wonderful. Uh, I, I should mention that the, the organizations that have that have really been behind this um, again, sort of coming from both Cambridge um, and Irvine, there's the Connected Learning Lab. Um, the Scheller Teacher Education Program um, and the Learning Games Network um, all have been uh, essential in organizing this event. The organizers include me. I guess I should have said who I was for those of you who don't know. I'm Eric Klopfer. Uh, <laughs> the organizers include me and many others here. I, I'll also point out Michael specifically. I mentioned um, we have the new Asia Pacific uh, sessions, um, and Michael's been key in organizing those. Um, but uh, as you can see here, it's taken a whole crew of people to, to make this event possible. So thanks to all of you. Um, and particularly the staff, uh, many of us who are joining us here, you'll see them in the help rooms as well. Um, the staff have really been essential in making this possible and will also be helpful to you over the next month as you try to find sessions or figure out ways to share your screen. So thanks to all the folks who have um, been helping out here. Uh, so with that, I will introduce the introductory, the opening plenary here. Um, uh, in the, and I'll get just a little brief introduction. In the past 18 months, as many as 1.6 billion learners across the world have had their education impacted by COVID-19. Facing remote learning, school cancellations, enhanced safety measures, and an ongoing set of changes and challenges. In the US, the pandemic overlapped with an overdue racial reckoning sparked by the police murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor against a backdrop of ongoing anti-Black and Asian anti-Asian violence. In 130,000 K-12 schools and over 5,000 colleges, students edu and educators navigated these changes while trying to create safe, stable environments for young people and working learners to grow and to flourish. Um, to kick off the CLS, we have three researchers with long ties to the connected learning community who have been studying life in schools and colleges during this tumultuous period. I'm happy now to turn it over to my colleague, Justin Reich, 
I'm an associate professor at MIT and the author of the recent book, Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education, to introduce our plenary panel. So over to you, Justin. Terrific. Thanks so much, Eric, and welcome everyone who's here. It's so exciting to bring the Connected Learning family back together, and I'm thrilled to have um, Liz Loesch and Tierra Tanksley join me um, to try to have us reflect on the extraordinary past year and a half um, and to think a little bit about where we're heading next. Um, so we're, we'll give some short presentations to start with and then turn it over to a, to a conversation that we hope you'll join in the chat as we're going along. Um, but um, Liz is going to help orient us to some of the things that have perspectives from higher education. Um, Tiara is going to help us think about the movements for racial justice and student and learner involvements in those exercises. And then I'll talk a little bit about our research in K-12 um, and try to listen closely throughout all of that to think about uh, some cross-cutting themes that we can keep talking about from there. Um, but as you have thoughts, as you have questions, as you have reactions, please do put them in the chat um, and, uh, and so we can be able to respond from there. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Liz um, to tell us a, a little bit about um, what she's been thinking about reflecting and learning about the experience of the pandemic in higher education. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Justin. Um, and thanks to all the organizers of the uh, Connected uh, Learning Summit. Uh, it's nice to see those uh, familiar names. Um, and uh, I certainly miss uh, gathering in person uh, at either uh, Cambridge or Irvine, but please reach out to me uh, either via email or on Twitter. I'm always happy to continue the conversation. So a few weeks after my second dose of the Moderna vaccine, I was back to teaching in face-to-face -face environments. So here I am with my online citizenship class uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, masked and mostly socially distanced, uh, largely immunized, and uh, returning to some semblance of normalcy. Um, but like most educators uh, for the previous year, I had been teaching uh, entirely online with some uh, exceptions involving outdoor office hours, but mostly this is how my students saw me during the past year. And I think one of the things that's uh, valuable about this particular time of transition is we have an opportunity to reflect about uh, how this uh, disruptive shift to online education uh, sometimes exacerbated existing power inequalities. Um, and to do this, I think it's helpful to sometimes look at philosophy. So uh, I was thinking a lot about the work of Roberto Esposito who writes about the difference between community and immunity. And community, uh, you know, we talk about being a connected learning uh, community. A community for Esposito isn't always a great thing because he argues that communities share obligations. They share sacrifices. And it's that kind of um, shared wound that actually brings people together in some ways. Well, immunity, right? The ability to refuse the demands of the community to declare oneself immune from um, those demands uh, offers certain kinds of agency and autonomy. So as we move from the community of shared sacrifice to a kind of assumption of uh, immunity and uh, self-preservation, uh, um, we have an opportunity to also think about our students' digital lives. Now, um, I felt like in the shift to online learning, I was in a pretty, privileged position. Um, I have designed and taught online courses. I've designed and taught hybrid courses. And I, of course, that's what my spring 2020 was. It started as an in-person uh, teaching experience and then moved to online. Um, I've worked with groups like the Selfie Researchers to develop open educational resources. Um, and I've thought a lot about alternative curricula that can be imagined in response to things like MOOCs. So uh, the FemtechNet uh, distributed open collaborative course um, for which I was one of the many co-facilitators um, is an important uh, touchstone for me when I think about ways we can think about collective online pedagogy. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. Um, and of course, when we think about a disruptive event like the COVID-19 pandemic, it's useful to think about other crowdsourced syllabi uh, and ways that educators have come together 
um, to develop knowledge collectively uh, using digital tools. So, you know, we can think about things like um, uh, syllabi that are, are generated through hashtags. Um, and also we can look at things like social media communities on Facebook where educators can come together and sort of explore uh, possibilities for uh, reparative work in their online teaching. Now for my classes, most of my projects are digital multimodal projects, right? So students are turning in work on Twine and story maps. Uh, it's Omeka projects, it's blogging, it's a scalar project. They're doing Wikipedia editing. And so I'm already interacting with my students through screens all the time. And so for me, uh, that wasn't a big uh, adaptation. Um, and obviously you have this opportunity to bring in renowned guest speakers using platforms like Zoom. So here you can see a group of students who were unable to attend the Duke um, Feminist Pedagogy Workshop. And here they are having a conversation with Judith Butler. Um, that went on for an hour and was very frank and revealing. So there are these possibilities that the pandemic opened up, but um, you, obviously you're gonna be missing things, right? You're missing things like teaching with board and card games, which can be really valuable ways to think about gaming and simulation. You're missing out on opportunities to do 2D and 3D prototyping with students. Um, you're missing out on those opportunities for those culminating events where there's really a sense of occasion around the pedagogical calendar. Um, and those are certainly missed from the face-to-face -face learning environment. Um, but in many ways, as a tenured professor, I was in a pretty privileged position. Um, but I think it's important to be mindful of the ways that the pandemic magnified inequalities in higher education, particularly around questions of labor. Um, so as, um, faculty members had to retool for online education, enormous uh, pressure was put, particularly on caregivers uh, who might have uh, elderly parents or young children uh, in the household uh, and households in which multiple people were trying to look, teach, learn and work online. Um, and the Modern Language Association has written about some of those uh, inequalities as well. And we also have this situation in which precarious teachers, people who are uh, adjuncts, uh, were often pressured to return to what they felt was an unsafe situation uh, in uh, providing face-to-face uh, -face teaching uh, in the physical classroom. So I've been writing a little bit uh, for some op-eds about ways that we can think about the pandemic in light of assumptions about access that tend to ignore uh, the valences of class, gender, disability, and race. Um, and I also think it's important to think about the household domestic space as learning space and the ways that um, that can also uh, put power relationships on display. Now, I've written a lot about the ways that we often see these conflicts emerging around learning and technology, where we see this conflict between the technologies that students use and the technologies that the faculty use, and this sort of sense that there's this battle between our technology, meaning faculty and their technologies, meaning students, um, and I think that that did um, get exacerbated during the COVID um, pandemic, um, which we're still in. I, I, I don't wanna put it in past tense. Um, I think it's important to pay attention to myths about digital natives. And any of you who've seen the millennial on TikTok memes know that uh, the, those so-called so digital natives are often drawing attention to their own uh, uh, literacy challenges uh, working with new social media platforms. We also need to really think hard about the ways that students are being surveilled in the name of education. Uh, I've been horrified to hear colleagues talk about students uh, coming to class in their beds or from cars uh, without realizing that sometimes the bed is the only private space that a student has. Sometimes the car isn't the only way to receive a reliable Wi-Fi signal. So of course students are coming to class in beds and cars and to be judgmental about that seems ridiculous. Um, there's also, it's also important to honor student back channels. My students thrived uh, being able to take advantage of GroupMe and also uh, for my electronic literature course, uh, a, a Discord server. And so I think uh, honoring the work that's done in peer-to-peer -peer learning in those student back channels is really important. Uh, we wanna support students who are resisting command and control. So when administrators try to prohibit uh, GroupMe's, uh, you know, we as faculty members really be champions for our students and for their advocacy efforts. 
Um, and as teachers, we need to question a vendor-driven pedagogy. This is something I've written about a lot, but I, I think you know these, sh these should be decisions being made by educators, not by vendors. Um, and it might be great to see Zoom celebrating uh, Halloween uh, with fun backgrounds and costumes, but we really wanna think about how Zoom became such a dominant player uh, in terms of market share. Um, oops, sorry, going backwards again. Um, and finally, it's really important to think about bodily control in virtual spaces. Um, with test um, taking a proctoring software like Proctorio um, that's actually working against um, disabled students and sometimes even just students that are tall. Uh, so, you know, what is happening that we're attempting to control our students' physical uh, entities in these virtual spaces? And instead, we can think about ways that we might collaborate with our students as Mark Marino is doing here in a piece of NetProv um, where you know, he's encouraged students to create this sort of mythical scenario in which they've all turned off their screens and renamed themselves student. So what are ways that we can kind of look back and look forward and think about technology in ways that are much more supportive of our students' needs? So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. The really important themes there, Liz, about um, surveillance and policing, quality, uh, the incredible resilience of young people during a really challenging period, the incredible resilience of, of uh, faculty, the unequal resources that we have to support that resilience. Um, and uh, I think that tease us up really nicely to hear from Tiara about uh, some of her recent work and uh, how it extends and connects to these ideas. Thank you all. Yeah, I see that there's a lot of overlaps between our our two conversations. So I'm going to um, quickly share my screen, hopefully. Wow, there's a lot of All right, I don't know if y'all can see this. I hope you can. Um, still getting used to Clouder. So my work, I'm, I'm an assistant professor at CU Boulder in the School of Education, and my work uh, really looks at the intersections between race, education, and technology, and trying to examine how matrices of domination, so racism, sexism, transphobia, et cetera, um, not only permeate our educational institutions offline, but they also are, um, embedded into the technology systems that youth are using um, during distance learning. And so my quick presentation today is called Freedom Dreaming in the Digital, Black Youth Co-Designing Racially and Algorithmically Just Technologies. So essentially, um, I've been working with a, a, a pro-Black, pretty much, uh, I would say like a culturally responsive critical race theory type of program at UCLA called VIPS. And uh, our program caters to black and brown youth in Southern California. And I was lucky enough to be able to teach a course um, called Race Education and Digital Wellness last summer during, during uh, 2020, which as you know, was you know not only COVID, but the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Avery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there was a lot going on while teaching this digital course. And so um, before even getting into this course, I had some research questions um, which were really just about how black and brown youth use internet technology to address, understand, and heal from racial trauma because healing is so important. I think when when we go into you know distance learning, we're really thinking about like how do I address you know uh, learning loss and how do I make sure that students have their cameras on. Um, and I thought it was really important for me to be intentional about thinking about healing and um, processing trauma, particularly given the racial dynamics of what was going on, um, and thinking about how technology could foster wellness and communal healing during during the dual pandemic, um, and then you know implications for universities and schools, how we can support the, the strategies that youth themselves are designing and, uh, and implementing. So essentially, you know, all of my work with Black youth throughout 2020 in the digital space and particularly in the summer um, revealed some 
I think common findings that we kind of already knew were, were going on. Um, so one of the big things that came up was mental health and coping and that having to do distance learning during um, a massive global protest against anti-Black racism and police brutality was exhausting. Students talked about having PTSD from seeing the video of George Floyd, from seeing you know all kinds of racist content on their social media, from having um, conversations about it in class that teachers weren't necessarily ready to have um, to facilitate in ways that were not violent or, or re-triggering. And so a lot of students felt numb, stressed, they had insomnia, headaches, all kinds of mental health issues um, and some physiological issues as well. Um, they talked about ways that they were trying to engage in self-care and coping. And one of the big things was creating these fugitive spaces online and offline. And so, um, you know, many of them felt completely humanized and reinvigorated by the protests that were happening during the summer. And they recreated that, those protests in um, digital ways. So some of them uh, got into a discord, um, my colleague, Arturo Cortez, Dr. Cortez at CU Boulder actually does work about um, how youth were using gaming technology to engage in digital protests. Um, and so his work is amazing. And I think that it relates to this of like how youth were um, engaging in healing in ways via technology. Um, and I think a big thing was that even though they were using technologies to engage in political activism, that they did not see technology as a way to engage in healing necessarily. Um, technology as it was currently articulated, right? So social media, Instagram, Twitter, those spaces felt like they were more violent than they were healing. And so they really wanted to think of ways to um, create different technologies to help them during, because they were kind of anticipating that distance learning, distance learning would continue. And this was in 2020. So as we know, it did continue. Um, so they started to kind of freedom dream about what technology could do to not only help them heal, but to protect them from racism um, and essentially uh, make their distance learning for fall 2020 a little bit better. Um, I also asked the students, you know, what were some of the possibilities? What were some of the, the positives of distance learning? And a huge thing that came up was that distance learning was a protective factor against the anti-Black racism that they were experiencing in schools. And so they essentially talked about, you know, I, I normally walk to school. And when I walk to school, I have to take this convoluted way because I know that there's like these police officers who are congregate in a certain area and they always stop and frisk us. And, you know, if I go that way, then I'm, I'm stressed that I'm going to be hurt or, you know, arrested or, you know, fit the description. And so I have to find this alternative way to school. Once I'm in school, I have to go through the, you know, metal detectors and all of the security systems, the surveillance systems. And I feel, you know, um, a lot of the young women felt violated by having to be pat down when they walked in. Um, all kinds of ways that race racism and sexism really combined and intersected to make the physical school space really violent. And we have excellent literature on this. We know this is to be true. Um, but, and that's on top of curricular units that are culturally hostile, you know, racial hostile, racial hostility in the campus climate, you know, all kinds of other things. So they felt like being at home in, um, in their own space with their families for many of them, not all of them, but for many of them felt like it was like a breath of fresh air where they didn't have to spend extra time trying to survive anti-blackness while learning. Um, and they often talked about using that time to quote better themselves. So they were like, you know, because I don't have to spend so much time thinking about uh, racism at school, I can do my college apps more. I'm taking naps. I'm, you know, talking with my family. I'm able to help out my mom more while she's at work because now I can be home with my little sister. So they were seeing the silver lining in this. 
they also, because they were in this VIPS course with me and my other colleagues, um, they felt that culturally responsive and justice oriented programs were humanizing spaces and distance learning, that these courses, the pedagogical moves that were being done, helped them see possibilities in distance learning that they weren't necessarily seeing in school beyond the fact that they got to stay home and, and how healing that was in and of itself. Um, but they saw that uh, they could they could actually form fugitive spaces similar to those protests and similar to their discourse spaces within Zoom. Um, and so they were allowed to use the chat in VIPs and they loved that. They felt like that was huge. They want their teachers to use that feature um, moving forward. They felt like they had for the for the first time um, a more humanizing approach. Like as black kids, they felt like they finally got cared for and this extended beyond VIPs because they feel like VIPs cares for them in general, but they felt like their teachers were a little bit more concerned for them um, because of the pandemic, right? And we've heard students, you know, across the country kind of say that, that like there was a little bit more flexibility sometimes. Uh, teachers were a little bit more aware of how burnout uh, or burned out students were feeling because of classes. So in general, they just felt like those uh, more humanizing features of distance learning were amplified when the space was designed to be culturally responsive and justice oriented. And then a really big thing was Zoom felt like it addressed some accessibility issues um, for some of my black students with disabilities, um, specifically like the transcription options, um, the asynchronous options. Some of my students um, were you know, in between homes. And so they felt like being able to message their teachers and, you know, say like, I can't come to the synchronous section because like, I don't have access to Wi-Fi, but I can watch the recorded session was like a really, it gave them hope and it, 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 it helped them be resilient in within a system that was not designed, right. Um, for students with multiple, um, intersecting oppressive identities. So actually one of the concerns by students is that when we go back to normal that, you know, some of these oppressive conditions are going to uh, continue and like the accessibility issues are just gonna be erased because people are like, oh, well, we don't need them anymore because we can go, you know, COVID's over and we can go back to school. Um, and so, you know, kind of <laughs> the last part of my work is as after we had this whole course and we talked about all of these things about COVID and how to survive and what we were doing to heal, um, the students also brought up how uh, they were starting to notice the ubiquity of technological racism and the need for digital counter spaces. And so my class also, uh, the focus in addition to mental health and education was about technological racism and how um, internet systems are algorithmically biased, how, you know, the carceration system is expanding via all kinds of, you know, terrifying technological developments. But the students themselves were noticing these in their educational spaces. So they were talking about how, um, you know, anti-cheating software was being used in schools during distance learning and how those software, you know, I know Proctorio was mentioned and Proctorio is a software that essentially, like you have to show your license to the camera to like for it to confirm your identity and then you have to turn the camera so it can see your whole room and make sure nobody is in there um things like that and then other che cheating software embedded in zoom like um the eye tracking the lighting uh, opening tabs etc that all of that felt like it was it didn't just feel like it they they were sure they knew that it was anti-black because many of them um you know they they live in homes it with multiple people in one room. And so they were flagged as being cheaters because they have siblings who are in the room with them that they really can't leave, or they live in a studio apartment. Um, that the lighting, they constantly got flagged for having low lighting, um, but it was really that the camera couldn't pick up uh, black skin. And there was all kinds of, you know, accessibility issues, disability assumptions built into those softwares that disproportionately affected black youth um, trying to engage in distance learning during COVID and the racial reckoning. Um, so while recognizing that, so we have this, this tension that like the students are relieved because they don't have to experience the offline racism in school, right? they're simultaneously realizing that there is technological racism that is permeating their distance learning at the same time. Um, so with that in mind, 
all of this in mind, they decided, you know, we need to design uh, a program, a platform that can protect us from all of these things. It can protect us from algorithmic violence, anti-Blackness, um, and really be a counter space for us to heal, you know, during COVID, but also beyond COVID, because we're always going to need this. And so one student said, we need a Lamert Park, but on an app, a place that we can all be home. And as you know, Lamert Park um, has a rich history of, uh, as a Black counter space, particularly just recently um, on Juneteenth, there was a celebration there. And so the students were kind of talking about that, like, how do we make that Juneteenth celebration like into an app? So just this last slide, um, we started to co-design a digital space about, um, it started last year, we're still working on it now because it takes a while to build a platform, but the youth are working collaboratively to actually design something that can foster mental health. So they're trying to think of ways to like provide race specific mental health sources, resources to each other to help each other, um, like take notes during shared classes, shared college classes, or um, you know, to address resource gaps. Like some students will be like, I don't have Wi-Fi or like my computer is down. Um, and they're, they've built a chat area where you can kind of talk about the need for resources and students will be like, oh, I have an extra laptop or you know, you can come over to my house, I have Wi-Fi, things like that. And so this space is still in the works, but essentially the youth are freedom dreaming beyond what is, what was told to them is currently possible, right? With with technology, to see technology as something that can be healing, transformative, and educationally just. And that's all I have. Really wonderful, Tira. Tira, you you. Um, I just have one fabulous. I have one point of order question. You use this term fugitive spaces, and you also use the term counter spaces or counter publics. Would you say a few more words about like, are those synonyms or did, did you mean something different by those terms? Fugitive spaces isn't, isn't the term I had heard before and just wanted to hear a little more. Yeah. Um, so I think, so basically I think they get at similar ideas. Um, the difference is really the discipline. So counter spaces comes from critical race theory and fugitive spaces comes from um, like black studies, uh, black feminist literature, things like that. And so while counter spaces kind of recognizes broadly how students or, or minoritized people can create these spaces that resist and push against um, institutional oppression, fugitive spaces has a very specific black History to, history to it, right? And it, it goes back to slavery and how black people actually found ways to escape the plantation, whether it was temp like temporary or permanently, right? Um, and so I think that it just adds that additional specificity. Well, it was it was incredible hearing more about your work, Tierra, because so many of the themes that you found um, in that community in Southern California are very, very aligned um, with uh, what we've heard in various ways, trying to talk to young people in all kinds of places over the past year and a half. So a lot of what I'll say will certainly echo um, what, what you and Liz have said before. Can everybody see my screen okay? Can somebody just unmute and say yes? Great. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Justin Reich. Um, I run a lab at MIT called the Teaching Systems Lab. Um, and about a year and a half ago, we had this sense that the world was going to be pretty different for a long time. So we dropped a lot of what we were doing and tried to engage in a number of forms of research to try to make sense of the moment that we're in. Um, we've been publishing most of this stuff at tsl.mit.edu slash COVID-19. Um, we did a study about what the 50 state agencies did right at the beginning of the pandemic um, to react to these challenges. Um, we did some work in uh, uh, May and June of 2020 um, to try to help people come up with some design principles and some ideas for reopening schools this past year. Um, and then we did interviews with 40 teachers across the United States um, in April and May of 2020 um, for a study called What's Lost, What's Left, What's Next? Um, and uh, we're in the midst basically of kind of replicating actually both of those last two studies right now, um, having a bunch of meetings with uh, teachers and families and students and school leaders um, to try to help think about what are, what are some productive ways of thinking about the next year and then talking some, with some of the teachers that we talked with last year with some new teachers to really try to understand, you know, what has the experience been like 
um, for teachers and students. I, I'll tell you a little bit more about one other study that we did um, where we've had a few hundred teachers now uh, interview their students about their experience the past year and send some of those results back to us as a way of thinking about next year. Um, one of the things that struck me um, over the last year especially um, is there's so much we actually don't know about what's happening in schools. Um, there are a few um, themes that seem to be sort of common throughout, but there's really yet to emerge a sort of wide body of research that descriptively um, characterizes what are the experiences of young people in schools, in library programs that open, in after schools and things like that. You know, I've, I've tried to continue to approach this with a certain humility, like there's still a lot of stories out there that haven't been told and there's still a lot that we don't know, even as there are some common themes that are emerging. Um, one way that I've tried to frame people's experience is, you know, even though the pandemic, you know, is, is one of the most shared global events that, that humanity has experienced in quite some time, um, everyone is really having a very different pandemic. Um, and, and certainly Tiara and Liz spoke to some of that as well. Um, there are some kids, young people who really thrived during the pandemic. Um, Tierra described something that we found um, often that, you know, for students who experience uh, racism or bigotry or just bullying at school, getting away from those things was great. Um, we've had students tell us, uh, you know, that my grades are fire this semester. I, you know, I've gotten rid of all these distractions that happened at school um, and now I'm doing terrific. Um, of course, for many students, um, it is not the case that the pandemic has been an instructional boon. Um, you know, most young people have found distance learning to be somewhere between uh, disappointing and disastrous. But there's this whole range of experience that young people are having. Um, you know, I, I, I think for this community, there are lots of opportunities to continue to ask questions about sort of exactly what went on last year. Um, how are science lab classes operating? Did student, did teachers send things home? Um, did they demonstrate labs? What, what happened to project-based learning and courses? Did they shift more to lectures? Um, did we see, you know, some, what kinds of changes did we see in reaction to sort of the constraining of the curriculum? Um, did people stop teaching social studies and science and arts so they could focus on English and language arts like our system has um, in very times of strain in, in years past. Um, there's still lots to discover um, about uh, what's gone on during the last year. Um, one particular example of this is as uh, we had teachers interview their students and get back to us about what they liked this year, we, we kept getting these responses that people liked the breaks. Um, and eventually I stopped and realized I just had no idea what people meant by breaks. You know, lots of different teachers, lots of different students reporting that they like more breaks. So I got on Twitter and started asking people, what are the kinds of breaks that you had in your school? And they told me everything imaginable. There were people that schools that extended their passing time, schools that went to a block schedule and then added 10 minute breaks throughout classes. Um, uh, there were people who extended lunch, who extended recess, who ended the day early and had a big block of time at the end. There's all these sort of different kinds of small scheduling changes that were made um, and exactly which ones were most common or how they happened or how people experienced them. There's still a lot for us to learn about, I think. Um, but one kind of summary, if you had to say sort of what the education system did overall this past year, um, is in a lot of ways they tried to as much as possible, when, when schools shifted to some form of remote or hybrid learning, they tried to replicate typical classroom practice using Zoom. Um, they focused on sort of making progress on standards aligned curriculum, uh, although there were a few places and a few calls um, for more emphasis on kind of home centered learning, learning that would be appropriate in people's homes instead of trying to sort of force school into home. There seemed to be a small number of districts that somewhat modified their schedules. Um, you know, some places decided to do three classes a semester instead of six classes in a year to make things a little simpler. Um, and there was a little bit of guidance from some states or some districts about how to constrain or reduce the curriculum. Um, but, you know, overwhelmingly, there was all, you know, many of the decisions that were made to adapt were really like very individual teacher level decisions. Um, one thing 
that was striking um, was to hear people talk about the technologies of remote schooling. Um, and we're in a moment where for the past two decades, folks have been telling us that we're sort of on this verge of a technological revolution in education. Um, but if you get people talking about what technologies they use to make remote schooling work, um, overwhelmingly there are two. Um, the, the two main technologies of the pandemic were learning management systems, things like Schoolology and Google Classroom and Canvas that basically allow people to pass documents back and forth. And then a class of technology that was introduced in the 1930s was called video telephony, um, which we now call video conferencing like Zoom or Cloud or Teams or Hangout. Um, and the core goal of this seemed to be to reproduce as closely as possible the typical routines of in-person classroom. We had sort of brand new technologies potentially opening all kinds of different possibilities. And then we took that new technology and we reproduced uh, schools, you know, in, in some cases almost exactly as they were um, when we had them in person, just through Zoom online. Um, and then these kinds of two main technologies tend to be supplemented with a variety of these sort of uh, disciplinary, kind, you know, a math app, a tutoring app, a reading app, you know, maybe something like Flipgrid to communicate with. Um, in, er, in, in sort of spring of 2020, there was a lot of interest in sending, you know, having each teacher send their kid home with three or four different apps to log into. Um, but if you had six classes in a middle school, that meant you had 24 things to figure out. And so parents and students revolted um, and most schools um, said for the beginning of this year, all right, we're gonna use a smaller, more constrained number of things. Um, yeah, so you know, despite two decades of education technology enthusiasts describing us as on the cusp of a revolution, um, teachers really chose in a moment of strain um, to adopt some of our oldest technologies um, and to largely replicate traditional classroom practice. Um, for teachers, they experienced some really extraordinary challenges this year, um, real challenges with maintaining student motivation, um, that the relationships that we maintain with each other in physical spaces are, are in many ways very difficult to replicate at a distance. Um, huge concerns with, with both Liz and Tierra talked about, about the expanding inequality. Um, and then I think another crucial feature of teachers' experience over the last year is if you are a 10-year, 15-year master teacher, you felt like a first-year teacher again, a, a novice, and just this sense of sort of loss and grief um, of, of what people sort of professionally lost as they were trying to make this year work. Um, and, and teachers are just absolutely exhausted right now. You know, it's extraordinary just how tired the education system is. Um, so, you know, one of the ways that I've framed this is that there are kind of two paradoxes of the pandemic. On the one hand, we dramatically change the operation of schools. We transform schools almost overnight to be able to operate remotely but we kind of made this sort of kabuki version of in-person schooling. For those who aren't familiar with kabuki theater, it's this beautiful Japanese theater where people wear big costumes um, and, and bright makeup and then sometimes do very, very mundane things, um, sort of extraordinary efforts to make uh, what we had before. Um, and then as we think about the future, you know, educators showed tremendous capacity for change and innovation. Um, so many things that felt really fixed, that felt impossible to move in school systems, all of a sudden we're like, oh, we don't have to do that anymore. Um, you know, I think what, um, what Tara was talking about, what Liz was talking about in terms of students with disabilities was exactly like that. Oh, how could we possibly make all these accommodations for students who might have to learn from home for a little while or deal with distance or other kind of, oh, no, actually we can do all of that um, uh, right away. Um, but um, at the same time, everyone in education is really, really tired. Um, this is a, a generation of educators from teachers and paraprofessionals and librarians and media specialists, superintendents, school board members. It's just so, it, it, the sense of exhaustion um, is so widespread. Um, one of the things that I heard in Tierra and Liz's talks, you know, and certainly something that, that echoes from my experience quite a bit, is that we don't want to go back to 2019. 2019 didn't work for so many kids, um, but it's going to be a real challenge, especially in the months ahead, um, to sort of resist the kind of comforts, the nostalgia of going back to the way things were, um, and, to, and to think about how even as all of us in the system are so tired, we can still remember that 
that incredible energy that so many teachers, so many educators showed over the last year to say, we can do something different here if it's gonna make a difference for our students. Um, that's a lot of what, uh, what I'm thinking about right now about how to do some of those kinds of things. Um, so maybe I'll pause there for a bit so that we can have some time to, uh, to get into a conversation with each other. Um, I'll stop sharing. And uh, um, the, uh, here's one like very specific, very granular thing that I thought it would be fun to talk about for a little bit. Um, because one of the findings from our research too is that one of students' favorite things during the pandemic, you know, one of the things we ask teachers to ask their students is, what did you like from the last year that you want us to keep? Um, and what are the kinds of things that you'd want us to get rid of um, in the next year? Um, what, are, what are the things you had to do during remote learning that you wouldn't want to have come back? Um, and you know, for, uh, for a whole bunch of students, like the Zoom chat and the back channel came up. Um, this is like a very sort of granular thing, three scholars from really different perspectives, and all of us talked about the back channel chat. Um, so as a, as a way of picking small things to reflect on bigger ideas, I wonder if Tiara and Liz, if you could just talk a little bit about, you know, how you saw students reaction to the back channel chat, the Zoom chat. And also if we go back in person, like what do you think it would look like to start experimenting with that again? Yeah, for, for me, the back channel of the chat was so important. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people disable the student to student features. And I think that letting students actually have those student to student features, particularly in a pandemic where the, 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 the teacher isn't necessarily seeing the conversation, I think that's really important to give students that ability to connect without us necessarily being a surveilling presence. Um, I found it hard to actually read all the chat between my courses because I had a 10 minute break and I'd have to like catch up on all the chat in my gender and digital culture class. Um, and just all of the links and ideas and sharing and heartbreak and honesty and humor and that, that was in the chat. I, you know, I, I, every day I'd save the chat and sometimes go back and read it in the evening because my students just, the chat was so important. What, what was your experience or what was your insights, uh, Tiara? Or, what, or what's, what's behind that and how might we, we continue, how might we take that thing that works really well online and find a space for it moving forward? Um, I don't know if I have the answer to the, that question just yet, um, but I do know that for the black students I worked with, they thought the chat was like call and response, right? Which is a linguistic cultural practice of black communities where um, like, let's say in church, the preacher says something, and then we all kind of respond back. And this uh, practice is uh, affirming humanity, and it's intentional, right? Because we are often invisible, rendered invisible and um, erased and ignored. And so being able to talk back and uh, have overlap speech where we're talking at the same time is really important. And, you know, Zoom in some ways erased that or, or made it challenging because as you know, with the audio, you can't really speak at the same time. Um, and so then it felt awkward and rude to do the cultural practices that make us feel connected. And so the chat feature really enabled that. And I think that um, the students felt more connected to the learning. They felt like they could laugh with each other, ask more questions. Like it was just liberating for them. And I know in the interviews they were saying, we need to find a way to make the chat in real life. And students were like, I mean, the chat is basically like, you know, passing notes, but we always get in trouble for that or like texting each other in class and we get in trouble for that. So maybe can we have something where there's like a back channel, like, you know, they were talking about, um, I don't know what the app is, but they have some apps where you can like text and like they all show up on the screen. They were saying like, we should do stuff like that, you know, because we can multitask. You know, there's this notion that we can't listen and engage unless we're sitting there quietly and, and just staring at the teacher. When in fact, the way that many students learn is by actively engaging with manipulating the material, you know. Um, so that's one, that's one option. But again, I don't have <laughs> the, the answer yet. Yeah, that, that notion that certain forms of communication sort of stopped working over video. We had this uh, 
terribly heartbreaking interview with a fourth grade math teacher um, who's uh, in uh, whose entire um, repertoire is was based on singing. Um, people called her the singing math teacher, um, and she would do these call and response songs to sing math. Um, and like technically speaking, with Zoom, you can do it. Like there's nothing that prevents the teacher from speaking in the microphone and all the kids from singing back, and it just totally falls flat. Um, and, um, you know, it was just, it, you know, it was like taking one of her arms away or take, you know, taking some kind of vital, vital piece of her teaching repertoire, um, uh, disappeared. Um, and, uh, um, so that I think is, uh, um, you know, is an experience that, that quite a few educators have had, um, you know, Tiara, you know, a second question that I wanted to ask you all in the last few minutes that we, that we have here, um, is certainly one that I'm reflecting on a lot and teed up, which is just how, how do we not go back? Um, you know, one of the things that we found is that there's is that there were some there were some things that we discovered um, that felt really good in the midst of all this awfulness. And there are also some things that were really awful that we managed to get rid of um, in the midst of all this awfulness. I mean, in our interviews, over and over again, kids would tell us, young people would tell us. They're so glad they're not being policed as much at home as they are in school. Um, and they're really upset about the idea of going back and being policed. You know, I mean, uh, I've been jokingly saying like a lot of young people learned that like you can go to school wearing a sweatshirt, <laughs> even a sweatshirt with a hood covering, and you can still learn wearing those clothes. Um, how, how do, for, what would your students say, Tira, about how we make sure that we, we don't go back to where we were before? You know, I think that they would ask us to really center systems of power and how those systems work to, you know, coerce, contain, push out black bodies and how the the shift to distance learning made those features that have historic, they're historically embedded and contemporarily active, right? That like it exposed those systems. And so being actually open to not only identifying those, but dismantling them. So if the students are saying, you know, um, we really appreciate days off, you know, distance learning days, asynchronous days, like, can we just, can we keep some of those, right? Um, if they're allowed to, like, like we were just talking about the chat, can we build some of that chat function in? Can we build, um, more culturally responsive pedagogies, curriculum, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the students have always had the answer, right? And I think we just need to listen to them. I, I think that we say we listen to them, but we don't because we'll be like, oh, well, we can't structurally do that. <laughs> we were just saying, um, but we can. So I would say that that's, that's something and that, yeah, I don't know. That's I, no, that certainly resonates with me. My my one sort of technical thought on that is people might be so tired that that they may decide they can't actually do some of those things by September, but it doesn't mean we can't do them. Um, what we can definitely do starting today and moving forward is we can ask young people about their experiences and we can share their answers with other adults. And if they, you know, and if we have a plan to go back to regular five day school, but they're telling us that four and a half day school really works we can spend some time this year really imagining what four and a half day school might look like. Um, Liz, how about in higher education? What thoughts do you have there about this question? Well, I mean, I think that sometimes uh, the most important use of Zoom is actually helping someone fill out a form or write an email when they're struggling with a mental health situation or a, a situation of trauma. And I think that, um, Figuring out ways that we can help students just manage the digital bureaucracy um, through a shared sc screen, I think is gonna continue to be an important thing. Um, I have a colleague, Amy Morrison, who every time she gets an email from a student asking for accommodation, she always writes back with, I know how, I really appreciate all the time and effort and thought that went into just getting started writing that email. And I think for a lot of our students, they just, they really need help with facilitating that communication, particularly when they feel disempowered. Um, and so I think that, you know, that's important, particularly in higher education where the bureaucracies are larger, 
than uh, at the local school level. Um, but I, I, I really think that that will continue to be an important thing. Well, Liz and Tierra, I want to thank you both uh, so much for helping us uh, kick off the conference with these really important ideas and these really important questions. Um, and I know that our uh, dear colleague and fearless leader, Mimi Ito, has a few uh, tips for us for helping to navigate the rest of the sessions and so forth. Um, so I am very pleased to have the opportunity to, to thank Liz and Tierra and to turn things over to Mimi. Thanks, Justin, and thank you, uh, Tara and Liz. What a fabulous kickoff to our very first virtual Connected Learning Summit, which is the biggest, um, in some ways, the most, you know, one of the most ambitious and international events we've held so far. Uh, this plenary was such a great way to um, kick off the conversation and you know hear from the wisdom and knowledge of our three panelists but also maybe even more importantly to raise the questions that i think we'll all be engaging in uh, through the course of this month together so big emoji hearts and claps to our panelists please um, i think as the panel really illustrated well uh, the connected learning summit um, as most of you know is really a space that's not just about knowledge sharing but about co-creation community building and of course a spirit of experimentation and particularly as our first virtual pandemic as we're just sort of starting to peek out of the pandemic reality we're really excited to be in this moment to be able to learn innovate and iterate together and i can't think of a community that's better equipped than ours to uh, think about what not only what should distance learning or hybrid learning look like but also what does a virtual conference look like what can community building professional community build building look like in um, using our tools and ways that are equitable, learner-centered, engaging, and playful. So we really are approaching this event with the, the spirit of innovation and uh, connection, not to go super meta. Um, and we're very uh, excited to be partnering with Clouder, uh, which is an open source platform that's backed by a nonprofit based in the UK. You'll see some of the Clouder team in the event with us. They're really partners. Um, Ed Netting, the CEO of Clouder, is actually in the backstage with us and on chat. So this really is a partnership, and we look forward to um, getting your feedback and input. You know, I count on the CLS community to be kind of right there with the productive feedback on technology. So we really um, want you your input and insight as we iterate in real time through the course of the month and beyond. So with that spirit, I wanted to just introduce a few aspects of Clouder um, to help orient people before we jump into our first uh, social um, event for the uh, conference. So first, uh, you know, the organizers, you know, volunteers are all available on the help desk, which you can find at the home screen. Uh, so we'll be looking forward to your feedback that, there. Um, and I think one thing I just wanted to really uh, emphasize is that, you know, Connected Learning and the Connected Learning Summit is really not just about pushing information, but about the social side, not just the um, and social interaction. So we've encouraged people running sessions to pre-record their presentations and to share their background materials through their abstracts on the platform. And people spend a lot of time recording their very nice videos. So please, please, please look at the sessions you want to go to, prepare, um, watch the videos in advance, get the non-interactive portions done as homework, and show up to engage and be on the chat and talk to people. Um, really, you're you're going into sessions, many of them, where people are sort of expecting you to have done that homework. Um, and then, of course, it wouldn't be connected learning if there weren't lots of opportunities for social interaction. If you haven't clicked on the little coffee cup there, that's where you can uh, find the um, social rooms. We set up a CLS lobby that's also available from the the home screen. And that's where you could just hang out with people in between sessions. Um, you know, you can just leave yourself idling. You can see icons of where people are. And there's also all the breakout rooms for the different sessions. But the lobby is kind of the default hangout space that we've set up. 
And then if you click on the people tab, you can see everybody who's registered. And there are quite a lot of people. We're over, we're getting close to 800 people registered. But you know, people will be in and out, and you can always access people through the chat function. There's a chat associated with every room, every piece of content, and you can also direct message people. You can set up your own social rooms on the fly. So Clouder is really designed not to be just like a Zoom video conference, but also to be a space where people can be connected and you can communicate with each other. And Clouder, another Clouder thing is it's going to automatically close this room um, at the in 23 seconds and you will be placed within the welcome lounge and it is what Clouder calls an exhibition space and you'll be able to see all of these social rooms listed and uh, many fearless members of the CLS community have um, stepped up to host these rooms which is our effort to really um, have a lounge where people